So anyway, we're on Ephesians chapter 2, and we're at that verse, you remember, uh, in verse 5. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And then verse 6, and raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I just once more uh, express to you the, the important point that this verse is saying that God raised us up with Jesus and made us sit with him in the heavenly places before we cried our first tear. That's the important thing. In other words, before we made our first move to repentance. That's quite important because I think a number of us still can misunderstand and can think, yes, yes, when, when I begin to confess my sins, when I begin to repent, then God begins to make me alive in Christ and raise me up with him and make me sit with him in the heavenly places. No, he has done that already. Faith is you saying, yes, Lord, I see that that's my position. So faith does not cause that position. That's the important thing. And I think Lewis brings it out himself, you know, in the part extracts we've been reading on Sunday evening, that uh, faith does not cause it. Faith sees it and accepts it. But the fact is that God has raised us up and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that is part of the torture and agony of our Father through the, all these years, that there is not one person who has not been raised up with him and made to sit with him in the heavenly places. He has, as it were, their seats reserved there for them. And he has made them sit there and he's saying, believe that you're here, believe that you're here. And because they do not believe, of course, they live in the darkness and death of the lie. But it is important for us who believe the other way to free ourselves from that subtle kind of slavery that we get into. Oh yes, when I become a Christian, then God raises me up and makes me sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that results in us yearning, oh, I wish I could become a Christian. I wish I had the faith that would make that possible. I wish I could confess correctly and repent perfectly and believe exactly so that that could be my state. And God is saying, look, I know it sounds as if I'm stupid, but you've been saved by absolute grace. It's absolute grace that has saved you. I have made you sit with me in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where I've put you. My son is here, and you are in my son. And he is enduring you, and we are both enduring you because we love you, and we have you here. Now believe that and live in the light of that. And it's important that we see that, you know. So that's why I just said again. Now, what are the heavenly places? Well, I have a, just a couple of uh, uh, more uh, uh, verses for you to glance at. Ephesians 3 and 10. Uh, it's mentioned there, Ephesians 3 and 10. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The heavenly places, uh, we've already talked about it. We've said that that's eternity, that's timelessness, you know. That's where God is. That's where everything is one great eternal moment. And it's very difficult for us who are caught in time to see the sense of that. But at this moment, God sees us all here. He sees Trish at 70 and Trish at 80, me at 120, you all at around 99. But God sees us all at this moment. He sees everything in one second, in one millisecond. So it's 
it's silly to talk of it as a place, you know. Uh, the Bible does talk about the heavens at times as the sky and uh, the place where the stars are. But the heavenly places are eternity or timelessness where God is, where God himself dwells. It's important to see that that's where the principalities and powers are. The principalities and powers are there. The principalities, uh, not only in the sense of the prince of this country or the prince of that country, as we saw in the Old Testament, at times certain angels are referred to as the prince of certain countries, but also they're the princes that dominate certain atmospheres, spirit of competition that uh, we talk about in our high school, you know, that is kind of harmless and then it grows up into Bill Gates, <laughs> or it grows up, Bill Gates isn't a bad guy, but it grows up into other kinds of competition that brings intense antagonism and hostility towards men. Uh, it uh, brings about that spirit that you find in the training they give to troops, you know, kill, kill, kill and that same attitude that develops even, I was talking with Marty about the rivalry and that kind of thing in schools and how it can become intense, the rivalry, so that you almost forget that this person is your friend. And of course we see it in, in great intensity in the corporate sphere where people will do anything to win over the next man on the totem pole and get the executive position. There are princes, principalities, spiritual powers that cause that. We have guessed it at times. We've said, how could jealousy get that kind of grip on a person? How could one man do that to another? We've certainly seen it when we've looked at the things that happen in the wars that are now taking place. And we see the things that are going on in Zimbabwe, and we see the things that have gone on in Chechnya. And we wonder, how could men deal with each other that way? How could they destroy bodies that are dead in such a dreadful, foul manner? And obviously there, there's a power there's a spiritual power that is greater than the human being involved. Now that's where these principalities and powers exist. In other words, it is a little bit uh, the way we had, you remember in Dunamis, do you remember Dunamis? That outstanding magazine that we did in Minneapolis. And uh, you remember, I think I had some of it had found somewhere in a magazine, you remember, and here was the, the, uh, the little English scene, you know, down here, a uh, little uh, a man with his plough and with his horses and the hens and the chickens, and up here were the battle going on between the angels and archangels and the evil spirits and the principalities and powers. And it was a very, very graphic, a very good picture of the fact that the world down here was being affected by all all kinds of spiritual battles that were going up in the heavenly places. And it's probably good for us to realize that that's where some of this power is coming from, in that sphere where God has still allowed. Well, in fact, it's, it's put more plainly in uh, Ephesians 6 and 12, if you look at it. Ephesians 6 and 12. <coughs> For we are not contending against flesh and blood. It's not just the Russians, it's not just the Chechens, uh, the Chechens, but against the principalities, against the powers, then very plainly, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And that's where the powers of wickedness are, in the heavenly places. And that's why sometimes when we're dealing with a problem, we're dealing with it in flesh and blood. We're dealing it with it primarily in terms of our thinking and our positive thinking or our clever thinking or even sometimes we think our correct thinking. And we're dealing with what is a spiritual power by means of just mental exercise. And of course, the only way to deal with it is 
to take the position that God has given us in Jesus. That's really the only way. To know ourselves that we have been raised up and made to sit with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, I think we can turn that into a mental game because we can say, yes, I must remember whatever this power of depression that is coming against me is, I must remember I am in Christ in the heavenly places. And so we try to battle a spiritual feeling or a spiritual atmosphere with a mental thought. You can actually only battle a, ment a spiritual atmosphere with another spiritual atmosphere. In other words, really what I'm saying is we need to live in that reality day in and day out. We need to live in joy in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We need to live in that truth every moment of our days. And then these spiritual powers, they are under his feet. They have been put under his feet. Yes, don't think that because there are spiritual powers in, heaven, in uh, the uh, heavenly places that they govern the heavenly places. No, he has been placed above those, and those have been put under his feet. But they, their, power, their authority is wielded from there. But his authority is greater. All you need to do is dwell in reality. But I think what we do is we don't dwell in that reality. We dwell in the midst of the day-to-day -day battles that we're having, and our mind is utterly preoccupied with it. Now, maybe it's good to say to you, that doesn't mean that you don't deal with things on the earth. Yeah, we fix the tires on the car. Yeah, we write out the orders for the people in the, in the shop. Yes, we answer their difficulties with buying this item or that item. But our whole mind and heart is not there. Our whole heart and mind is in Jesus at God's right hand. And we're living there and rejoicing in that. And then when the spiritual darkness comes to us, then we're up there, we're untouched by it. So it's perhaps good for you to think about that a bit more, you know, that you can't deal with the spiritual darkness by just reminding yourself that you're actually above it. The reminding yourself that you're above it won't do it. But the living there, day in and day out, will do it. And living in the reality, living, really, it's what we said, faith is the victory, you know. But faith is living in the reality of it moment by moment. Faith is not exercising the right thinking. It's living in it moment by moment. It's taking this verse and thinking about it and dwelling upon it meditating about it night in, through the night, in the middle of the night, through the day, in the middle of the day, and above all, acting in the light of it. But acting out because of the truth of it. Too often we're saying to ourselves, well, now I'm supposed to be happy, I'm supposed to be whatsoever things are true and lovely and a good report, okay, I'm supposed to be like that, I'm going to be like, and it's all flesh, it's all mental, and exercise of will. It is very different if somebody comes to you and says, here's five million dollars. Now, it's not because we all want money, but just you think to yourself, oh boy, that's nice. Well, that's the money thing solved. I mean, unless I'm really stupid, that's the, I don't need to think again about money. Well, the reality of it affects you, you know. You just, it's just there. Now, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about living in the faith of your position that God has given you at his right hand. That's where you are. And the more you realize that and live in that, the more far above all these 
spiritual powers of wickedness in heavenly places you are. And that's what God has for us. Uh, you can, you know, you can do it the way old knee does it, you know, he says, well, uh, you know, here am I, and here is Christ, and I'm in Christ, and I raise the book to there, so where Christ is, I am. You know, you can do it with that kind of little uh, mental uh, illustration. <coughs> But really, all it is a, is a mental illustration. What you have to do inside yourself is determine, are you going to live there permanently? Are you going to live there permanently? Or are you going to live down here and try to make little mental excursions up there? In other words, are we sitting with him in Christ Jesus at his right hand, or are we not? He says, you are my child. You are. Let's pray. Father, you have said that seed time and harvest will not fail. And we see the seasons have come round faithfully. We have seen the sun rise every day. You have supplied all our needs, as you promised. So, Lord, we know that if everyone is untruthful. You are truthful. You are true. What you have said is truth. And we see, Lord, that you have plainly said that you have made us alive in Christ. And you have raised us up with him and made us sit with you in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. And Lord, it is only our place to say thank you. And with relief to take our place at your side far above every rule and authority and dominion and power, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And to dwell there in joy and in peace and safety and in victory. Oh, Lord, we would turn now from these temporary shadows that we have spent so many of our hours in. The temporary shadow of a failed sale or the temporary shadow of uncertainty about our future, the temporary shadow of what someone has said to us, the temporary shadow of all the many things about which we're troubled. We would turn from all of these little graynesses and darknesses and turn to this bright world where you have placed us in your Son, at your right hand. A place where there will be no difference for us between the last breath here and the first breath there. The brightness will not change. Lord, we thank you. We do not presume to come to this thy table. Most merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. 
we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so by faith to receive thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, that the bread which we break may be unto us the communion of his body, and the cup of blessing which we bless may be the communion of his blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us.